went from doing live streams of graduate shows to selling collections of young designers um, to having a very transparent and open editorial platform, a job section and so on. But we started the year being a complete digital platform and I might no, not know what um, the future of retail is and we had this discussion back in summer. Um, but we ended up, or we're ending this year, um, by having organized five of the biggest fashion pop-up stores um, that the world has seen on three continents. And I'm going to tell you these five stories. Now again, what I really find interesting is of course that digital is coming together with offline. We started the year again thinking this is the opportunity for digital. We ended now with having physical online shops. We're opening a, a physical store next week in New York City. And I wonder if this is actually a trend, if this is um, not only the online world needing offline retail or bricks and mortar, but perhaps there's something more behind that. In the beginning of the year, I was asked by the government in Dubai to come up with an idea to enhance something called the Dubai Design District. You might have heard of this project. Um, we were quite cynical when we heard about it. They wanted to recreate Shoreditch and Williamsburg and Berlin Mitte all together in the desert. That was the briefing. And we traveled to Dubai and said, well, there is talent. There's talent in the Middle Eastern region. Um, and on top, there's a huge problem in terms of talents not being able to access the European and American market anymore. Um, if, you, if you come from Lebanon, if you come from Ukraine, if you come from Russia, you probably know how hard it is to get, to get a visa to come to Europe these days. So our briefing was to come up with the ultimate pop-up store. And yes, this is a pop-up store. Um, and we said, well, why don't we open a shop where we earn a fee, we, we are allowed to bring our designers to Dubai, we make a selection of 400 different designers, whereas 200 designers had to come from the Middle East. We let them sell and actually access 100% of the retail price, and we're allowed to open the shop of our dreams, basically. We came up with a plan for 120,000 square feet of space. Um, that was not only retail, it was workshops, it was concerts, it was 3D printing, it was manufacturing. And we opened this shop on the 1st of April this year with 21,000 people coming to the shop on the first three days of opening. What we realized is there's a huge opportunity out there for finally showing something different, for showing um, something credible, for showing uh, genuine, authentic luxury. And the audience in Dubai was not only uh, made out of tourists, but it was traditional families, um, it was expats, it was tourists, of course. But as you can see on this picture, what was really important for us was to almost push retail into the back and almost say, well, why don't we open an experience pavilion? And that's what we did. So what, we, what this shop, I think, what the successful bit of this shop was is um, the mix that we, at some point, we were not reliant on the turnover of the shop. So again, this was a win-win scenario for everyone involved. We were able to create the shop that we wanted to create, which in our eyes was to create an experience. We were able to bring our designers to Dubai. But for us, the content was really important, the experience, the workshops, uh, the events happening. At the same time, we were able to offer a very transparent and very direct opportunity for designers to retail. In May this year, we went to Venice, or a small town outside of Venice called Vicenza. You might know it if you're um, into jewelry or ma manufacturing. And this is a project that started actually three years ago. And we were asked by the Italian government and the region of Venice to come up with a feasible solution to underline the Made in Italy brand. So how can we help craftsmen and manufacturers in the northern Italian region of Venice um, to, again, become the sort of first port of call for young designers perhaps leaving St. Martin's and wanting to create their samples. Um, back in the days, in the 80s, if you remember that, young designers used to buy a one-way ticket to Italy and had all their samples made there. Unfortunately, designers now go somewhere else because they can do that from their phone, doing that with a manufacturing agent, perhaps in Portugal or in India. Our idea, again, was quite bold. We said there's a big pavilion outside of Vicenza, 150,000 square foot, and we said, why don't we create the biggest pop-up experience that combines B2B and B2C. They laughed at us. Um, the budget was, was quite high because we said our principle of the website is designers will never pay a single penny for doing business with us. So we said we want to have 100 flight tickets from all around the world, 100 hotel rooms. Um, you can imagine the amount of dinners and drinks. Um, we want to have that space and we, we want to have full creative direction of what we want to do. The idea was 
to bring the 100 most talented young designers from around the world together with the 100 selected manufacturers from the region. So we had the weavery creating Chanel fabric since uh, decades. We had the jewelry manufacturer. We had 3D printers from the region. And we brought these people together in an environment that I think the world hasn't seen yet. The condition was everyone had to bring their studios and workshops from all around the world and fly them to Italy. Um, so you can imagine a logistical nightmare, but this is a trait. This is a boot of one of the Italian leatherware manufacturers. And we brought these people together in an environment where um, they could network, they could meet, but at the same time, we then opened it up to the public as well and said, well, all the designers are there, all the manufacturers are there, why don't we sell whatever they're doing? Why don't we sell this story? Again, we had 10,000 visitors per day coming to this trade show pavilion, um, engaging with designers, engaging with manufacturers. We even had a day where we closed the doors and we said, today is the day where you guys have to meet each other. We had a speed dating session. Believe it or not, we actually had to bring the designers together and some of them couldn't speak Italian, the other people couldn't speak English, but um, you can imagine the creative explosion in this pavilion. We then went on and today we'll hear from Zalando as well. We got a call from Zalando um, asking us about our opinion of Berlin Fashion Week and for who has been to Berlin Fashion Week, unfortunately, it is not a great experience. It has nothing that resembles in some way the creativity and, um, and the edginess of Berlin. Um, unfortunately, Berlin Fashion Week is a very corporate event and young talent from Berlin or from Germany don't really see uh, Berlin being a sort of showcasing platform for their talent. And with Zolando, um, we developed a concept where we said, well, our dream scenario will be, again, similar to Dubai and Italy, to actually invite German designers on a selection ba based um, or a selection to come and showcase in a space in Berlin where, again, they don't have to pay. They can showcase to the buyers, but also they can showcase to consumers. So I want a space that is open and democratic. Everyone could walk in. Um, we put a huge focus on workshops and education. So we had talks from the local three universities. We had Google there. Um, we had fantastic workshops in terms of designers teaching other people how to do things. Um, we had a shop on the first floor, which was taken over by Zalando. Um, and our products, we had a restaurant, we had a digital corner. Again, it was a dream project. And again, um, the sponsoring part in this case, Zalando, so not a government ourselves and the designers, we all walked away as, as people who, who gained from this fantastic project. Um, this space was open for five days. Uh, we had close to 10,000 people seeing the space um, this summer in July. And finally, in July, instead of going on holidays, and I would kindly ask you not to tweet about this project, um, instead of going on holidays, we were asked by the mayor of New York, because they've seen these projects, to come up with uh, another project that we could take to New York City. So New York um, has a fund that is called Made in New York. Um, you can see the logo on top. And that is a fund to, uh, similar to Italy, to in some way incentivize and underline manufacturing and talent from New York City. Um, we applied, and I don't advise anyone to ask for U.S. taxpayers' money, but we did that. And we spent the whole summer applying for a grant to open our own retail shop in New York City, and um, we won that in September. And again, what we said is the funding that we received from the city was not enough to go to Fifth Avenue and rent a shop. So we said, well, let's play the game as we used to play it. Let's try to find a partner who is willing to come in and who wants to profit in a completely different way and seeing retail as something different. Um, we were in touch with the Hilton Group and we said, well, you guys have a fantastic hotel in Midtown that in some way is a little bit dusty and needs some fresh energy. Uh, and again, a hotel that has so much history and fashion. And um, we were given the location for free. So we're opening in 10 days in New York City, um, a retail shop on the left side of the entrance. And again, I think this is a fantastic example of bringing people together. Designers will sell their goods that have, the condition is that the goods that we will sell have to be made in New York City itself to, un, to support the garment district of New York City. The Hilton Group and the Waldorf Astoria, finally they have a new fashion project to show off with. Uh, unfortunately, fashion of, in the last decade in New York City has moved downtown and we want to bring it back to Midtown. Um, this is where fashion started um, about 100 years ago in New York City. And finally, um, for us, of course, um, there's a profit in this as well, and I think we're closing the year with about a million pounds in net 
profits from five pop-up stores that we've done, and we have never rented a single location. So I'm not sure if that's the future of retail, but it's certainly a solution it has been for us. So 50% um, of our business now is offline. We have architects, space designers in our team, um, something that we couldn't have imagined in January. So thank you very much for listening. So is what you're doing, Stefan, essentially starting a conversation for people who need to sell things? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's, people come to us because we, you know, we, we have the whole spectrum. We, we work with the schools, we work with designers, we have the credibility. Um, we have the website which runs almost as a magazine. For example, the reason why I told you not to tweet about it is because we will announce the opening four days before the opening of the shop. We have an exclusive with New York Times, but then again, we are on PR machine because we have 20,000 designers around the world, so we almost don't need anyone else. We're all close friends here. We're on your side. I trust everyone here. And what <laughs> lessons have you learned that will be useful for existing retail brands? Well, I think it's, it's just seeing things from a different perspective. You know, we, we started the business and we never had an investor and therefore we were never in the position to sort of play with money and therefore we had to be smart to come up with solutions like these ones. And, you know, I can tell you that the amount of times people laughed in our face and said this is not going to work because it costs too much money. But I think, and hopefully, um, you know, my colleague from Zalando afterwards will, will tell you if it was worth it for them. But I think people walk away from a project that is win-win for everyone. And, and that is possible. Do you think more traditional retailers need the temporary pop-up experience? There's the Wonder Room in Selfridges. A lot of people are thinking about how we can create a sense of serendipity and surprise. Would you advise them to? I mean, I, I can't stand the word pop-up anymore. I think we've, we've heard it, and, but I think it's all about the story and, and the, the storytelling. And we keep on using these words again, but I think it, you know, the Berlin example just showed we had people coming in and spending three or four hours in that space while shopping, while attending a workshop, while watching a film. And, and that is possible if, if you take the pressure away. You know, that's easy said than done because um, we didn't have to pay any rent, but we were able to almost sort of, you know, retail was secondary, it was about the experience. Um, but I think we, we pushed, I think we pushed the limit a little bit and, and it, it shows what, it, what is possible. Retail space is story. Thank you, Stefan Siegel. Thank you very much. <laughs>